speed, John Glenn. When I was a kid, there was no such word as astronaut. I thought it'd be great to be a pilot sometime, but I never, we didn't have enough money to take, for me to take flight lessons. When I was growing up, my dad, uh, one time we drove by a field where there were, it was a, a plane, an old biplane, open cockpit, uh, taking people up for rides. And uh, so my dad and I went up in that airplane, and I was only about eight or nine years old. And uh, I thought that was neat. That was the first time I'd ever been in the air. And to look down on all the houses and the people and cars and things was really something. Before World War II, I was in college by that time, and uh, there was a notice on the physics bulletin board that you could take pilot lessons, the government would pay for them, you'd get your private pilot's license. And it's called Civilian Pilot Training, CPT program. And so that's what I went through and got my private pilot's license in the spring of 41. If you talk to him, he had a pretty humble upbringing in Ohio, um, and, uh, and uh, he went into the Marine Corps at an early age, and. Uh, got married at an early age. As a matter of fact, he and Annie, uh, I think, shared cribs in the same hospital room when they were born, believe it or not. Pearl Harbor occurred at the end of, of uh, 41. Uh, I dropped out of, of college in the middle of my junior year and uh, started flight training and, and then uh, was overseas later on for a year during World War II. He was in World War II as a fighter pilot, he was in uh, Korea as a fighter pilot, and then he was a test pilot for the Marine Corps. So he had a humble upbringing, just like the rest of his very down-to-earth person. When NASA finally got interested in sending somebody into space, it was such a new thing, it was all very, very secret at that time. In the midst of the Cold War, here the Soviet Union and the United States poised to annihilate each other with with nuclear weapons, and it was an extraordinary time. Of course, we were all given orders, which were supposed to be secret, to come to Washington and to not discuss the reason for those orders with anyone, even our wives. Being a kid uh, growing up on the east coast of Florida at that time, as all of these astronauts as we were trying to catch up with the Soviets who had shocked our pants off of us. The Russians, I think, were pretty confident that they were far ahead. Uh, after all, they had launched Yuri Gagarin in April of 1961. Uh, we had launched Alan Shepard, but it was on a suborbital flight. President Kennedy had made the announcement about going to the moon within a decade at the end of May, but uh, the Soviets didn't take that very seriously. In fact, they went off and launched their next uh, cosmonaut, so it was a brand new experience for everybody. Nobody had been through this before. We went through a long selection process, and which included physical and psychological and all every measurement they knew how to make on the human body, I guess. Uh, those early pioneers at the Cape were something else because not only were they uh, flying by the seat of their pants many times, uh, designing rockets on the back of an envelope, uh, but all the time they were swatting mosquitoes and dodging rattlesnakes and alligators. So when we finally came down and we were finally selected, we were very happy to be there and felt honored to be among the seven to be selected. Uh, the original seven were, of course, figures that were revered. The engineers who were doing the designs, the launch crews who were doing the day in and day out work, and then the crew sh shimmying in into those little tin cans called capsules that were taking us into the heavens. The mission was planned to come back and land on the water. And so we did a lot of water training on it too. So what would happen if you had a leak in the spacecraft after you once hit the water, uh, what the impact would be. Uh, uh, if you're underwater, could you get out? We went in the, the pool, turned the spacecraft with us in it, 
uh, it's only a one-person spacecraft at that time, but they turned the thing upside down, then you had to escape from, get out underwater and come up. And training like that, that tried to train for every possible contingency. But what if you had to land in the outback in Australia, which is one of the places where we went up over the, over one of the tracks of the uh, spacecraft, uh, or across the uh, jungle area of Papua New Guinea, for instance, or uh, Southwest Africa, Namibia, in that area. We trained for all of that too, with desert training, where we were, went out, were isolated in the desert, and how you would survive uh, for several days before they could pick you up. Trained in jungle training, went down in Panama or, and Colombia. Uh, went in the high canopy jungle and survived for three days. And uh, so we did a lot of training that way so that if you, you ever, it was never necessary to come back to Earth on an emergency landing, uh, that you'd be able to survive whatever the conditions were, whether you came down the jungle or the desert uh, or the land someplace. When I got to fly the shuttle, I knew what to expect. I think when John flew his first flight, he didn't know what to expect. And that's a huge difference. <laughs> Both we and the, and the Soviets at that time were using boosters that had been designed as ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, for the launch of nuclear weapons around the, whatever the target might be. Well, then when it came time to put a man into space, we didn't have a, a separate booster designed just to do that. We used the ICBMs that had been used for a different purpose. That was a big day for America. Uh, the Soviets had not only beat us into space with Sputnik, but then they had beat us into orbit with Gargarin before we ever uh, even got Alan Shepard up into suborbit. We were behind in the manned space program as far as ability to lift weight because we had been better than they were technically. We had been able to make small nuclear weapons, lighter nuclear weapons, and they had to design a booster for their great big uh, Hiroshima type weapons uh, and so here when they used that booster for a space program they could put up a huge amount of weight where we couldn't. Ours were smaller boosters because we had miniaturized nuclear weapons. When John first launched uh, he was on a brand new rocket, uh, never been to orbit before. Uh, we didn't know uh, how humans would react in zero G. We didn't know whether they'd be able to eat. Uh, some people said their eyes wouldn't focus. All kinds of crazy stories that John told me that they told him before he launched to expect. He didn't believe any of those, and most of them were not true, but we just didn't know back then. The day that I finally went, that was my, that was the third time I had actually suited up and been on top, been locked in and ready to go. And it was canceled once by problems with the spacecraft, another time by weather. But when you finally get in the thing and you're ready to go, uh, you're very, very busy. People think you're in there contemplating great thoughts, and I think it, it's more likely you're in there, as I was, double-checking all the instrumentation and talking to the people on the ground crew uh, to make sure that uh, everything was okay for launch. Godspeed, John Glenn. Six, five, four. Roger, the clock is operating. We're underway. He's loud and clear. Roger, we're programming and roll okay. Godspeed, John Glenn. I was in the blockhouse when he was and the last to speak to him before liftoff. Gus and Al had both done that, but they weren't riding on this big, big fuel tank that had enough, had the ability to give him more speed than what Al and Gus had had. They didn't have enough to coast all the way around the world. They just had enough to go up a little ways and fall back to Earth. People look at all this fire and smoke on the ground, they think you're under huge stress inside. You're not. Uh, the thrust is just barely greater than the weight of the spacecraft, so you lift off very gently. And the more the fuel burns out there, the lighter it becomes, and the thrust is still high. So the farther you go up here on this entry into space, the more, the more G's you feel inside. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Capsule is turning around. Oh, that view is tremendous. Roger, capsule turning around, and I could see the booster during turnaround just a couple of hundred yards behind me. It was beautiful. 
Roger, understand go for at least seven orbits. When I was inserted into orbit, the first thing it did was uh, the, the spacecraft turned around. So the heat shield was forward in the direction that I was going. That was for protection. And uh, I could look back across uh, northern Florida and uh, clear back along the Gulf Coast. And it was a beautiful view and uh, quite impressive, too. First time I'd ever seen anything from that kind of altitude, for sure. And you're going almost five miles a second to stay up there in orbit, which takes you around the Earth uh, in about an hour and 29 minutes, about every hour and a half, uh, you're going around the Earth. So it's, you have uh, very short days and short nights, about 45 minutes each. Here on Earth, you look at a sunset or sunrise, you see the oranges and, and uh, yellows and, and reds, uh, but you don't see the other end of the spectrum. Uh, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, right across the spectrum. And that uh, blue, indigo, violet, you see that kind of luminous, luminous uh, quality in the color just at sunset and sunrise in space. So it makes it different than anything you've seen here on Earth. Uh, this is Friendship 7, and I'll try to describe what I'm in here. Uh, I'm in a, a big mass of some very small particles. Uh, that are brilliantly lit up, like they're luminescent. I never saw anything like it. They're around the little, they're coming by the capsule, uh, and they look like little stars, a whole shower of them coming by. A lot of brilliant, uh, well-trained engineers and scientists on the ground heard John say, I see things out there that look like fireflies. This large body of expert intellect was all of a sudden wondering, are there living creatures out there? Because John called them fireflies. Uh, they, do, they do have a different motion, though, from me, uh, because they swirl around the capsule and then depart uh, back the way that I am looking. Are you receiving? Over. I had heard nothing hit the spacecraft or no malfunction that I could, could see from the instrumentation. And so it was a big surprise to look out and see all these little flakes. And they, fireflies is exactly what they looked like. That's the way I described them. On the next flight, Scott Carpenter tapped the side of the spacecraft and a whole shower of them went off. They were uh, flakes of frost that came from the water that the cabin and the suit heat exchangers exhausted and they became inanimate pieces of ice and it was an interesting discovery. Uh, I don't know that anybody ever fully explained why the luminous color though right at sunrise as the first light of sun came on the little particles because that that was the strange part of it but uh, that was very surprising and it didn't pose any danger, but uh, it was there at each sunrise. Atlantic ship, this is Friendship 7. Uh, we do it past the Cape. I let the capsule drift around to the 180 degree position and uh, I am having to reorient at present time. Uh, when I am all lined up with the horizon and the periscope, my attitude indications now are way off. My roll indicates uh, 30 degrees right my yaw indicates three five right, and pitch indicates plus four zero. I repeat, plus four zero when I am in orbit attitude, over. Everything worked perfectly, and then there was an indication that John's heat shield was loose, which meant that after the third orbit and on the deorbit, uh, that he would burn up if it was. Well, I certainly want to make it a two-way trip and come back, of course, <laughs> but. The automatic control system had, had a malfunction. That meant that, that uh, I was flying manually, I cut all the systems back on so that I was operating as well as the, the, the automatic systems uh, during re-entry. That used more fuel that way, but had just enough to, to do that. It's the first thing I actually remember in my whole life, is sitting in front of our nice black and white TV on the floor, because I had to get real close because you know, I was really excited about this, watching the John Glenn flight. And the thing I remember most about it is sitting there worrying 
about whether or not John Glenn was going to survive when that heat shield was you know, getting loose. Was it really loose? Uh, was he going to uh, you know, burn up when he re-entered? Uh, it was a very exciting thing, and I think that's probably what inspired me to be interested in space and how I wound up becoming NASA chief historian in the end. When you enter, as you do a deorbit burn, which essentially you turn the vehicle backwards and you slow the vehicle down just enough that it can drop back into the atmosphere. In the case of a capsule, it can't really fly like an airplane. It mostly just falls straight. During re-entry then, instead of jettisoning that retro pack here uh, and getting it off so I had a clean heat shield for re-entry, we left that on so that the heat shield would be held in place until the aerodynamic force of re-entry uh, would tend to hold the heat shield in place. Now that made for an, an interesting, well the, the re-entry was going to be interesting anyway, but it was even more interesting because as I would glance occasionally out the little window, I could see chunks of that retro pack breaking up and coming back by the window. My condition is good, but that was a real fireball, boy. I had great chunks of that retro pack breaking off all the way through. Rocking quite a bit. I may still have some of that pack on. I can't damp it either. And I couldn't be absolutely certain then whether it was the uh, heat shield breaking up or the retro pack. And uh, obviously it was a retro pack or it wouldn't be here today. But anyway, it was a that kind of re-entry was the second problem we had in addition to the uh, control system failure. If you listen to the tapes, it's pretty clear that he knows that there's something going on there and it's not the normal procedure because he knew the procedures really well. He knew that retro pack should have been gone. His odds of, of, uh, of not surviving this was about one in six. So it was an extremely high risk, unknown effort that they were going into having never done it before. Holding the retro pack on there would actually keep the heat shield in place. There was reasonable assumption that might actually help. But then again, it might also you know, wobble around and knock it off too as well, I suppose. So there's probably a lot of concern about that, but it seemed like probably the only decent course of action that they had available to them in a reasonable thing. As he went into the radio blackout period uh, on re-entry, the last thing you could hear was John humming the battle hymn of the Republic. Main shoot is on green, shoot is out in reef condition at 10,800 feet and beautiful shoot. Shoot looks good. On O2 emergency and the shoot looks very good. The rate of descent has gone to about 42 feet per second. The shoot looks very good. My condition is good. It's a little hot in here, however, over. The mercury capsule, you have to remember, is a really small thing. So when he's re-entering, he wouldn't have been very far from all that heat that was being generated against that ablated heat shield. So I imagine it might have gotten pretty warm in there. Um, and of course, it would have been a pretty rough ride as well because you're uh, going through uh, a tremendous change in speed and altitude and uh, g-forces. Uh, so you know, all those things combined together, it must have been an interesting ride coming down. And of course, nobody had done it before from that speed, from orbital speed. So uh, you know, the later astronauts had the benefit of John Glenn's information about how it went, but uh, he would have been the first to do it, and it might have been an interesting ride. Uh, coming out of the blackout period and saying, Houston, this is Friendship 7. And of course, the nation went nuts. The world went nuts. Later on, on the ground, after they got the spacecraft back and ran tests on it, they found that these two signals that went down to the ground that had indicated a loose heat shield were not, uh, they were faulty signals. The Friendship 7 standing by for impact. Remain in capsule unless you have an overriding reason for getting out. Over. All right, your Friendship 7. Friendship 7 getting close, standing by. There we go. Friendship 7, impact. Rescue aids is manual. Friendship 7, uh, this is still that uh, holds you in the water. Uh, what is your condition, over? Uh, Roger, my condition okay. Does the capsule look like it's okay, over? The Friendship 7, uh, reference your last safari. Uh, capsule looks good from here. Ready to affect recovery in approximately uh, four minutes, over. Uh, Roger, four minutes to recovery. Uh, my condition is good. A destroyer that came alongside and put up a, a cable down a devit and, and picked me up and set the spacecraft on, on the deck of the ship. 
and I blew the side hatch and climbed out. Then it was taken over by a helicopter. I lifted off uh, later and went over to the, uh, the carrier and the, then flew that night into Grand Turk. And we spent three days debriefing with the uh, controllers and engineers that came out there for the debriefing sessions. There was a you know, great sense of togetherness and, and marvelous accomplishment that we all felt throughout that period. They wanted to have celebrations in Washington, and there was a speech to a combined Just meeting like of Congress, the Senate and House meeting together, and spoke to them and met with the president. And uh, then they had New York ticker tape parade. That was a that was quite an experience. It was like a snowstorm of paper coming down. And somebody told me not long ago that that was the biggest ticker tape parade that there ever will be. And I said, no, nah, there's always going to be some bigger ticker tape parade. And they said, no, because uh, back then you still had ticker tape and you still had a lot of paper stuff that's not used in offices now. And uh, so now when the, they have a ticker tape parade in New York, they, uh, the maintenance people will gather up a bundle of, uh, of paper and take it up on the roof and toss it over. And the buildings in New York now are built so you can't open the windows even to throw things out. And plus there isn't the same kind of paper in the offices now that we're in a computer time as there were back then. So uh, there was some, they measured the tonnage of what the street cleaners pick up after something like that. So I don't know whether that set a record that'll be there forever or not, I have no idea. It was a total resounding success. And uh, it was a great, great honor and pleasure to be a part of such a marvelous and successful program. And then President Clinton gave him the chance to fly again. See, President Kennedy wouldn't let John go because he was too much of a national treasure. And so all of those years later, then President Clinton says, John, I want you to go back into space. I'm sure John was tugging on his coattail. So I was very, very surprised to, uh, to find out that, that they wanted me to go fly this mission. A huge privilege for me to get a chance to do this and to go fly with this uh, living legend. When he came back in, the, one of the first things I noticed is that, that he came back into the space program like he'd never left it, like he hadn't forgotten anything. Time had advanced, but he understood all the principles of space flight, how to do it, what to do, how to train. Uh, at the time, he was holding down two jobs. He was uh, training for our flight. He was also still in the United States Senate. So he would run back and forth to Washington, D.C. for different uh, meetings and, and uh, hearings and votes, and then he'd run back and train. Uh, he kept up a brutal, brutal schedule that I don't know as I could survive, and I'm a lot younger than he is. Then he had a chance to see and really soak in the sights that he never got a chance to dwell on in his three orbits. And if anybody deserved to go at age 77 and to show how the human body at that age can adapt, well, John was the one that deserved to go. A lot of people think of John as, a, as an astronaut. Um, those of us that are um, with similar backgrounds think of him as a test pilot, may think of him as a fighter pilot. Um, you know, a, uh, a former Marine, uh, I'm sure as most of his buddies uh, from the Marine Corps consider him. And some of us consider him a senator or a politician. I think his legacy is in all of those areas because quite frankly, he's excelled in all of those areas. Um, he'll be probably always remembered or be most famous for his uh, role as an astronaut. But I, when I think of John, I don't think of astronaut. I think of all these other things that are associated with John. The greatest compliment I could give to John is that he and Annie are the people you want to live next door to. His legacy really is as an example of, 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 quite frankly, what an American should be. John Glenn is the all-American boy who became the all-American hero that became the all-American public servant.